So uh, a few years ago, I was working for Olivet Nazarene University as an admissions counselor, and I had the chance to travel out to California. It was a once-in-a-lifetime trip at the time, and, and uh, we actually got a chance to go down to Hollywood, and we were staying at the Hollywood Renaissance in, in downtown Los Angeles. It was awesome. We were getting ready to go to Universal Studios and, uh, with the team, and we were all ready, and my friend Adam and I were, were getting onto the elevator. So we walk onto the elevator, and we could feel the elevator kind of bounced a little bit. And we thought to ourselves, I said to him, I said, hey, this is one of those hydraulic elevators. So it's not the cable pulley kind. It's actually like a piston, you know. And, uh, and I said, if we jump high enough and hard enough, we can get the elevator to bounce, right? So we get in the elevator, and all of a sudden, we, <laughs> like, together, we're two grown men bouncing up and down in unison this elevator, and the elevator starts to, to, starts to rock, and we're going down floors, and this thing is bouncing up and down. It was awesome. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we heard, <laughs> and the elevator stopped, and this red light and this buzzing sound started. <laughs> And it said, seismic survey. And uh, all of a sudden, these two grown men who were just acting like little kids were now petrified like little kids. And now we were stuck in the elevator. Well, this is now an adventure, isn't it? You're stuck in an elevator in the Hollywood Renaissance, so what are you going to do? Well, what do I do? I climbed up on the railing, and I start to open the top hatch of the elevator. This is an emergency situation, folks. It calls for emergency measures, right? So, so Adam opens up the door, and he starts reading the instructions of what to do. And the first one is, please do not try to climb out of the elevator. And he turns around, and he says, hey, don't you know? What are you doing? I'm waist deep out of the elevator. And I was like, this is my moment. I'm like, I am, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened. Like, I am now officially Ethan Hunt, Mission Impossible, and I'm going to climb out of this elevator. Well, Adam starts grabbing my leg, pulling me back down into the elevator, and it says, number one, man, don't try to climb out, you know? So now we're trying to figure out a couple of different things. Read step two, you know, dial the, push the little button. There's a little red button that says, in case of emergency, you know, you push this little red button. And all of a sudden, we, we were looking for if there was a camera in the elevator, you know, because you, right? So now I'm standing up on the railing, and I'm looking into the dark panel over by the numbers. And I was like, is there a camera in there? And if there was, it, the people that were watching that feed were getting the story of a lifetime, <laughs> right? So, so this adventure gets really crazy and awesome, and so we push the button, and this lady comes on, and she is trained to hold people calm in this, in this adventurous emergency. She's like, Mitsubishi Elevator Company, my name is Dawn, how can I help you? <laughs> well, Dawn, we're stuck in an elevator. She's like, oh, I see that you're stuck between the fifth and sixth floor at the Hollywood Renaissance. We sent a technician on the way, and we were like, okay, great. Well, in the meantime, we could hear banging out in the, outside the door. We couldn't open up the doors, you know. And then all of a sudden, a few minutes go by, and we, we sit down, and we're, now we're just stuck there. We start singing songs, and, and, you know, my friend Adam and I, we were like, dude, this is going to be a memory forever. We're never going to forget this. In fact, I had lunch with Adam this past week. I was going to tell you a different story about an adventure in my life. And Adam and I were sitting there eating lunch, and he goes, dude, do you remember that time in the Hollywood Renaissance? I was like, I'm telling that story on Sunday. <laughs> so the coolest thing is uh, the technician comes, and he, he's able to get the door open a, cr a crack, and he says, uh, I'll be right there. It might take me a few minutes, you know. So he goes up onto the roof to do what he needs to do, and then all of a sudden we hear, we hear, click, 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 and the elevator starts to lower to the floor that we were in between, and the doors open. Well, um, the, the technician comes back around the corner. He's this, you know, old man, overalls, greasy, you know, I mean, that's just what you picture in your mind, and he says, you know, it was the darndest thing. He said the elevator thought that there was an earthquake. I said, Adam and I, being the good Christian boys that we are, we looked at each other, we looked at the technician, and we said, there sure was an earthquake. We felt it. And uh, 
they ended up, they ended up bringing a tray to us with, with um, a, a bottle of Mar- Marlot. We had no idea what that was. And Brie, what's Brie? Right? I mean, this was a nice place, and we were, and, and the guy, we like said to the guy, like, hey, uh, we, you know, we don't drink. Um, and he's like, oh, well, what can I get you? And we were like, can we get a couple of Red Bulls? And he's like, sure, you know, and they, you know, they had no idea, but we knew what happened in the elevator, and the seismic survey was two people named Adam and Steve. That was the, the earthquake. But I want you to think about the last adventure that you've been on. Now, that wasn't my last adventure, but that was an adventure that I'll always remember. So think to yourself right now, what was the last adventure that you ever been on? And then I want you to think about what did you do? What was memorable about that adventure that you were a part of? I mean, I look over here and I see Aaron Heinrich, and Aaron went to Yellowstone, right, and lived there. That was an adventure, and the things that happened there and the things he did there were incredible. And I'm sure that he could tell you stories and remembers even now some of the things that he did. But I want you to think about that. Now, here's the most important question I want to ask you. Not just what did you do and not just, um, uh, you know, where, who did you uh, or where did you go, but I want to ask you, who did you go with? You see, adventures are amazing and they become even more amazing depending on who you're with along the journey. And I can remember, you know, growing up, I had all these incredible adventures as a child. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that. And our movie today that we're going to be discussing is Up. How many have seen the movie Up? Great movie. Now, I have to warn you, I am showing the scene that everybody cries at, okay? You all know. You're already ahead of me. They're like, I wonder if he's going to show that scene. I am because it's a great image for us this morning. But the coolest thing about the movie Up is it starts out with an adventure. It starts out with two kids who, who they have uh, their, their hero in life who is an adventurer and goes around the world and does amazing things. And the one place that the adventurer has gone is South America. And they just want to go to South America as these little kids because they have that sense of adventure. So I want you to meet our two main characters now. I want you to meet Carl and Ellie. We gotta play the other one first. Oh. Oh. The other one first. The... Yes, as Munch himself says, adventure.
thought you'd see something. I have never shown to another human being, ever, in my life. You will have to swear you will not tell anyone. Cross your heart. Do it. My adventure book. You know him. <gasps> Charles Munch. Explore. When I get big, I'm going where he's going. South America. It's like America, but south. Wonder where I'm gonna live? Paradise Falls. A land lost in time. I ripped this right out of a library book. <gasps> I'm gonna move my clubhouse there and park it right next to the falls. Who knows what lives up there? And once I get there, well, I'm saving these pages for all the adventures I'm gonna have. Only, I just don't know how I'm gonna get to Paradise Falls. That's it! You can take us there in a blimp! Swear you'll take us! Cross your heart! Cross it! Cross your heart! Good, you promised. No backing out. Well, see you tomorrow, kid. Bye. Adventure it up there. You know, I like you. It's amazing when you get to go on adventures with friends. When you get to do incredible things. And, and it's funny because if you look at it, Carl isn't adventurous at all. But Ellie is incredibly adventurous. Carl doesn't say very much, but Ellie speaks enough for both of them. And Ellie's the one that kind of pushes Carl ahead. And when we look about, and we think about that, think about the times in your life when you've had, you were a kid and you had that abandonment. You had that desire to just do incredible things. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Stand By Me, but that's a really good portrait of my friends growing up. I had five friends, and we were all two months apart. Now, we didn't have necessarily the old freight uh, uh, railroad tracks, but we had what was called the Northeast Corridor um, uh, from, you know, Washington all the way up to New York City, right outside of our, our houses, and we used to walk down the tracks, and we used to have all these incredible adventures. We used to go to, um, we used to, go to a place called Indian Rock, and we would climb up Indian Rock. And, and you know, there were times where I did not want to jump off of Indian Rock. I mean, you look down and all of a sudden it's like, where am I supposed to jump? There's rocks all around there. And my friends are like, just aim for the dark spot. Oh, okay. Just aim for the dark spot, oh, you know. And then all of a sudden you're standing there and your friends are kind of nudging you along. And there's a part of you that says, I don't want to do this, but all my friends are doing it, Right? And, you know, there's a lot of times when that actually can become a bad thing, but then there are also the other times where it's great to have people who are going to cheer you on and who are going to motivate you. I mean, going on an adventure with friends is something that is really awesome. So John 15, I want you to turn to John 15 with me. It's page 824 in the Pew Bible. So if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, turn to page 824. But John 15, starting at verse 13, Jesus talks to us about being a friend. And what he says to us is, is really important. In verse 13, he says, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now remember, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in slaves. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. You see, Jesus called his disciples. If we remember in Matthew 4.19, the word tells us that, that follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I like to think of the breakdown this way. Jesus told them the first step was follow me right? The second part of that is, and I will make you. Jesus is telling them, if you follow me, that's step one, if you follow me, then I will make you, is the next part of that. And then the last part is, fishers of men. See, fishers of men is the product. 
It's that's what you're going to do. Now think about these disciples. Think about these, these simple fishermen. They knew how to fish. They knew how to throw a net out. They knew how to bring a fish in and gut a fish and, and all of those incredible things. But really when we look at the, at the trajectory that Jesus was bringing them on, it wasn't just, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Jesus, I'm going to follow you, but I want you to make me into something. And when you make me into that something, what is it going to be? It's going to be a person who doesn't fish for fish anymore, but it's going to be a person who fishes for men. They can't do that on their own. They don't have the ability to do that on their own. And Jesus was calling these fishermen into a life of adventure. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. They had no idea. All they knew was that a rabbi stood on the shore and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what did they do? Okay. And they dropped their nets and they followed Jesus And the journey that they were on was absolutely incredible. Now, I want to ask you this quick question. What nets do you need to drop this morning? What nets is stopping you from having an incredible, adventurous life with Jesus? Because for them, it was security. For them, it was finances. For them, it was was all of these different things that they knew they had to get rid of. They had to drop the net. And then when they did, they would follow Jesus, and Jesus would lead them on this incredible journey journey, and they would learn a ton along the way. Bob Goff, who, uh, Goff, who's an author, and he wrote the book Love Does, has a great quote. He says, when Jesus invi- invites us on an adventure, he shapes who we become with what happens along the way. Isn't that good? See, when we keep reading in the scripture, and we go back and we look at, at verse 16, he says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Each one of us this morning is chosen by God. He chooses each of us. And we do have the ability to follow on mission with him or not. But it doesn't change the fact that he chooses us. So when we do get to the place where we say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to drop my nets. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to desire for you to make me into something that I can't do and be on my own. Then we get to understand what that scripture means. You didn't choose me. I chose you. How awesome. We keep reading in verse 16, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my commandment, or this is my command, love each other. Let's go back to Carl and Ellie's story because the story continues. They met as little kids I love the fact that on the door of the house it said spirit of adventure. The little balloon that Carl was carrying said spirit of adventure. And they had this desire to do something amazing together. And they met together as kids, but then their story continues. Let's take a look at that. Filled with ups and downs. And Pixar did an amazing job being able to show an incredible sequence of events that helps us to understand that that Carl and Ellie, when they first got married, they had dreams. They had their adventure book. And, and then life seemed to get in the way. They, life is filled with t- flat tires and trees falling on houses and broken legs and even infertility. But they went through that together. They went through it together. See, what I don't want you to miss is the fact that they had dreams to go to Paradise Falls since they were little kids. But life situations tended to get in the way. They never really dropped the nets and, and went. You see, what situations are getting in the way for you this morning of the greatest adventure that you can have with Jesus? You see, there was a movement in here, and I didn't even see it before until I started to research it for the, for the message this morning. But they were friends first, but then they became family. They were friends, and then they got married, and they became husband and wife. And I don't want you to miss that movement because for me, I can remember all the incredible adventures I had with friends, but it pales in comparison to the incredible adventures I have had with family. Like two years ago, we went to the fairy pools in the Isle of Skye in Scotland. If you've never been there or have seen it or heard of it, it was amazing, but it was one of those adventures. We showed up at this lodge, and, and, and we said, oh, well, we want to go to the fairy pools. And they said, yeah, you just go over this hill, turn left at the sheep, and just drive back or walk back 
you know, eight miles, it'll take you about 40 minutes to hike back into it, and then, and then it'll open up and you'll see these pools. I mean, there was no road map. There was no, it was literally just my family and I trudging out, turning left at the sheep, and, and, dry, and literally walking back into this middle open area. I can remember the times with my dad and I where, where he would surprise me with trips. And I remember the times and the adventures we would have when, when the President of the United States was landing at Philadelphia Airport. My dad and I happened to be um, over watching the planes land. So he was a pilot in the Air Force. And, uh, and he had his radio out. And it was amazing because all of a sudden he heard this special kind of signal go out. And then two um, armed men came up and actually put my dad on the, on the car and wondered why we were out there. And I mean, we were both looking at each other. I'm like, my dad's totally getting arrested. <laughs> and we were like perfectly on, you know, public property and everything else. And little did we know the president was actually going to be landing in Air Force One. But those are adventures. I remember those. Those are memorable. And, and it's amazing when we think about the difference in, and being on an adventure with friends is great, but being on an adventure with family is really something special. You see, God, through Jesus, doesn't want to just stay our friend. He wants to be our family. So I want to end here this morning by, by sharing with you this incredible, important principle. If, we've, if we picture our relationship with Jesus over here, and we picture this incredible relationship with God the Father over here. There's a movement that needs to happen. You know, Jesus says, you will be called my friend if you do my commands. And, and, and I firmly believe that, and I think that's the desire of our hearts, is to have a friendship with Jesus. Um, I was trying to pull off that YouTube clip, Jesus is a friend of mine. Have you seen it by Sunseed? Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is a friend of mine. Anyway, so you have to see it. But that's what worries me. That's what worries me about when we talk about a friendship with Jesus. Then we end up picturing Jesus like a buddy Jesus, like our buddy pal friend Jesus. And we just kind of chum around with him and hang out and, it's, and, and we get to experience life with him and, and everything. But the problem is it has to go further than that. We have to go past the point where Jesus is just kind of buddy Jesus, like, hey, you know, I'm here to hang out with you, to the point where we call God Father Abba. Romans 8.15 tells us, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. There's a movement from just a friendship with Jesus to a love for God, the Father. Abba, there translated, is means daddy that we call God Daddy. It's amazing when we look at Matthew 6, 1 through 18. There's 18 verses in Matthew 6, 1 through 18, but 10 times Jesus says to his disciples, he talks about his heavenly Father, and he talks to the disciples not about his heavenly Father, Father, but their heavenly Father. He says, your heavenly father, and he says, your father in heaven, or your father, and then he even instructs them in verse 9 to pray, our father who art in heaven. You see, Jesus made the transition even with his disciples. He said, he said I am your friend, but I want God to be your father. And it's hard. We can't separate Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. So we understand that relationship with Jesus. We understand it in the context of the relationship with God the Father as well. Listen, listen. Jesus came as a friend to reveal God as Father. And I know that some of you sit this morning and you think about your relationship with your earthly father. And for some of you this morning, that relationship is torn and it's tattered. And when you think about God being the heavenly Father, it's hard to make that connection point. But I want to tell you this morning that Jesus, being the high priest who sympathizes with us in every way and understands, he points to an incredible image of a father in heaven who loves you dearly. Who loves you dearly. Listen, Jesus called his disciples to a life of adventure. And when you follow Jesus, life becomes even more adventurous. You see, when we're in an adventure with Jesus, it it's amazing, and then we realize how much God loves us and the, and the love of the Father. He says, you end up risking more. You end up testing more. You end up trusting more. You end up following more. 
when we follow God into this adventure. The word adventure literally comes from the Latin word adventura. Did you know what this literally means? Adventura in the Latin, what it means is it means to come or something is about to happen. Think about this. If we tend to look at life with Christ as an adventure, it's a life that is yet to come. It is a life that is full of something about to happen. Every turn, every corner, if you're trusting in God, he wants to lead you in a life that you might not know what's going on down below you, but Jesus says, aim for the dark spot. Jesus says, aim for the dark spot. Take the plunge. Just jump off. I'm with you. You see, because the incredible thing is when Jesus invites us on an adventure, he shapes who we become with what happens along the way. Let me close here by telling the story of a famous British explorer. He's Irish born, but he was a British explorer. His name is Ernest Shackleton. Ernest Shackleton led three expeditions to the Antarctic. Now, some of you have maybe have seen the advertisement that he put out into the London paper because he needed to get people to come on this adventure with him. But he had to be incredibly honest in this advertisement because he wanted people to know what they were getting into. Look at this. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. What? Whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute, what? Here's the thing, many of you, maybe you've heard this story told before or you've heard about this advertisement that Ernest Shackleton took out in the London Times. But do you know how many people responded to it? I was thinking when I first heard it, I was like, oh, maybe like two or three guys were like, well, I've got nothing better to do, you know? I'll follow Ernest Shackleton into the Antarctic. No, four thousand men responded. Four thousand men responded to this advertisement, and look at what he's selling. Hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of darkness. This is the part that gets me. Safe return, doubtful. You're probably going to die out there, right? And here's the best part. Honor and recognition in case of success. Folks, Ernest Shackleton just wrote out the biography for a Christian. No praise, no glory for you, small wages. You know, the world is going to hate you. But here's the best thing, honor and recognition in case of success. Do you know who gives you the honor and recognition in case of success? Your heavenly Father. Through Jesus, you know, our our value is not found in how we, in, in, in what we do, in who we are now. It's going to be seen in what's to come. It's going to be seen in, in what's after. But we live now, like we've been talking about, thy kingdom come. And we say, our Father. And that's my hope and my prayer for us this morning is that we would get to a place in our dynamic relationship with Jesus, that Jesus just isn't just a friend. He doesn't want to stay a friend. It's okay that we have a friend in Jesus. That's important. But that is a movement. There's a movement there that leads us to to understanding that God is our Father, and we can cry out to Him and say, Abba, Abba, Father. And He leads us in this life, this adventurous life. I'm going to tell you right now, folks, um, We have an Ernest Shackleton. His name is Jesus. And he calls us out of the boat and he says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What nets do you need to throw down today? What what has gotten in the way of your adventure book? Ellie and Carl had an adventure book. What has stopped you from, from throwing down your nets and saying, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to follow after you. You've called me to incredible places. See, Jesus, if you allow him, he will call you to incredible places. You know, and sometimes we tend to think that that's exotic places like South America. It's like America, only south. (laughs) 
But it's not just the exotic folks. It's the places where Jesus calls you that you live the greatest adventure. Would you stand together as we close? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning, again, challenged by your word, but also excited about the opportunities. Lord, living this life of adventure, there are times when, when it feels really, really scary. There are times when you talk to us and you've even told us in your word to have a childlike faith, to live this life of abandonment towards you, that you look at each of us, and I believe this morning that you are speaking to the heart of, of someone this morning and you're saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So Jesus, I pray that we would put our nets down. I pray that we would recognize the, the, the powerful move in the relationship with you and just not treating you like a buddy Jesus, but, but recognizing you as heavenly father. Being able to get to the point in our relationship with you when we cry out to you, Abba, Abba, Daddy. So Jesus, your spirit is moving. What adventure awaits? What is to come? Something is going to happen. And I pray, Lord, that we trust in you for greater things. Would you just hold your hands out, Trinity, this morning and receive this benediction and this blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. You are dismissed.